Today, as we come to the table, it's not the things of the world that will make you happy. It's not the silver and the gold. Again, that can be a blessing and there's nothing wrong in that. And God does that from time to time, but that's not going to fill the heart. Talk to wealthy people. Does the money alone fill their heart? Absolutely not. Maybe a year or two, you know, because it can be exciting and thrilling by what you can do with that. But when it comes to living life and looking toward death and we're looking toward the future, it means nothing. It's got to be something real. It's got to be a relationship with the Lord. And, and I love this because, again, you know, Jesus is the door. He's the gate into heaven. He is the beautiful gate. He said, I'm the door. We all look for life in something other than Jesus at times. We think we'll find more life in wealth or partying or in healthy living and working out. But Pastor Mark reminds us today that Jesus is the door. He is the door to eternal, vibrant, and abundant life. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Everything else can provide temporary relief or satisfaction for this life we're living but none of it can provide true lasting comfort. The only one capable of that is Jesus Christ. The only thing that will satisfy is life lived with Him. Where are you looking for life today? Where are you looking for comfort? Are you following old habits or are you following the one who can save? Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 3 as he begins his message, A Marred Man at a Beautiful Gate. You have your Bibles, let's open them up to Acts chapter 3. As uh, we get settled in to look at the Word today and, and just looking at really a marred man by a beautiful gate. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. And God, I thank you, Lord, for your church. God, for raising your church up and what it is your church is supposed to do and who it is your church is supposed to be. And I thank you, Lord God, that for many of us who are marred men outside the gate, Lord, of, of the true place of worship, like we're going to see today, or maybe marred women outside the gate of the true place of worship, or out marred children, or marred teens, or whatever the case, God, all of us are marred by sin, and we need you. And whatever our, our state is today, Lord, I thank you that you've made a way in, a beautiful gate into the kingdom of God. And I pray that you'd speak to our hearts today. I pray that if there's any here today who don't know you, that before they leave this place, they would understand what we're talking about, Lord, when we talk about the beautiful gate and the beautiful kingdom, and our beautiful Savior. And so we thank you, Lord. I pray you pour out your spirit, and I pray, God, you just open your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, in Acts chapter 3, as I said, we're looking at a marred man at a beautiful gate. Last week, we spent some time speaking about the four pillars of the early church. And really, if you want to kind of qualify these two, that would be the structure of the church. We saw what the structure of the church, I believe, is supposed to be in the model that God has given us in the book of Acts. Today, we're going to see the action of the church. You know, if the church has all the structure in the world, but there's no action, what good are we? We can work on all four of those things we talked about last week, the four pillars or the four structures of the church and what makes the church the church. But if we're not taking action and doing anything, it does no good. The church has to go out and be the church. I think over the years of being a believer, I would hear people say, and I understand what they mean. They would say, well, you know what? I just go out and I try to smile and be nice to people. And, and, and I'm going to lead the people to the Lord through that. I believe God can use that. God uses a smile. God uses a friendly personality and all those things. But if they don't know why you're smiling and they don't know why you're friendly and you never tell them about the fact that Jesus loves them, then how are they ever going to know the gospel? So there has to be that where, where the two meet. Yes, we have to be, you know, have the right attitude and the right heart and we have to have the right structure for a church. But unless we're taking action, it does no good. So there's a whole combination of things that have to take place for the church to be successful. And that's what we're getting into in chapter three today because we saw the structure put in place. Now let's look at the action. And I want to jump right in because there's a lot to look at today. 
Notice the scene. Remember, we just saw that uh, the whole picture of the church growing, the pillars in place, everyone loving each other, and the church being established there in Jerusalem, meeting on a regular basis there in Solomon's porch, the place of the pillars there in the temple area. And we come to chapter 3. Now we see the church taking action. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, which is the ninth hour. Now, the Jews had three different times a day they would go to prayer, the nine in the morning, 12 at noon, and then three in the afternoon, or we would say the evening prayer time. This was the evening prayer time. Uh, this would be the ninth hour, and of course, they went by different calendars, the Roman calendar, and also, that's why it doesn't always say, it doesn't mean nine o'clock. This means three o'clock in the afternoon, and so they would go up, and they'd set aside a time each, you know, every day to go and pray three times a day. Now, can you imagine that being in our culture today? Wouldn't that be great if we had three times set aside? Well, we went to pray as a culture. I mean, they did that in that day. I said, if you tried that today, your boss would have a little bit of a problem with you, except at the 12 o'clock hour, I'm taking off a little while here at 9 o'clock and a little while at 3 o'clock to pray. You'd probably say, you better pray by the time I'm done with you. Get back to work. But they did that. And so they're going up here at 3 p.m. And it's interesting here, when you look at the early church, it was predominantly Jewish. As you know, there were very few Gentiles that were saved. It was really a Jewish church at this time. And this is interesting to me because when you look back at the early church and the Jews that made up the church, they didn't stop being a Jew when they came to Christ. And one of the things I hear today, if you talk to Jewish people and maybe you have Jewish friends, they'll say, how can I stop being a Jew and become a Christian? We need to understand that in the gospel, we need to show them, maybe even here in Acts chapter 3 and say, wait a minute, the Bible doesn't say you have to stop being a Jew, continue to be a Jew, that's who you are. You're, from the, you're a descendant of Abraham by your bloodline. So we're not going to tell you to stop being a Jew. That's who you are. But you don't have to stop being a Jew to be a Christian. You simply now have become a completed Jew. Now you've believed in your Messiah. Now you've accepted your Messiah. And again, it's amazing how many Jews today believe that they have to suddenly change all these things. Yes, they have to receive the Lord. But that doesn't mean they can't still be Jewish and have that Jewish aspect to their life. Now they just are no longer under the law, and they have Jesus Christ, their Messiah, which has made them complete. So they're going through what the Jews would do in their regular prayer time, Peter and John going up to the temple, and notice a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, so his whole life he's been crippled, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. So they'd lay him there every day at the gate beautiful, and he would beg, basically for money. He was just a beggar in that day. It's interesting, the language used here, because when it talks about Peter and John going up to the temple mount, it speaks in the imperfect tense there in the language, which means on a regular basis, which was what their habit was to do. But it also speaks in the imperfect tense here of this man going up to the temple, being carried to the temple. He did this on a regular basis as well. So what's my point? Both of them going to the temple on a regular basis, but both of them going for entirely different reasons. And I think that's challenging for us today as to why we come to the temple of God. Now, this is not the official temple. This is not the house of God. His place is a lot nicer than this. But this is the place that we gather. This is where his church comes together. This is where his people gather together. And notice it says they carried him there every day to the temple. But notice when he went to the temple, he didn't come to give he came to take. And that's challenging to me. When I think about why we come to church, why did you come this morning? I mean, just right now in your heart, why did you come? Some of you are saying, well, I wanted to come hear the teaching. You know, I know you guys go line by line, verse by verse. Some are saying, well, I wanted to hear the worship. You know, some are saying, well, I wanted to add friends I was going to meet. Some of you might be saying, well, I needed to come here because there's something I'm looking at to be fulfilled in. And I understand that we have needs that need to be met. But I think we need to challenge ourselves, gang, as the church. Why are we coming? Are we coming like Peter and John to come and to give to each other and to give praise to the Lord? And if we do that, you're going to get filled. The Bible says those who water will be watered. And what that means is if you are coming to give, don't worry, you're going to be filled, okay? Or are we coming like the beggar who is simply coming just to take? Well, nobody said hi to me today. Nobody greeted me today. Well, listen, I know that we need to greet each other. I know that we need to be kind. But that's not why we come to church. We come to church not to be greeted. We come to church to what? To greet. Good answer. See, our job as believers, there may be some unbelievers scattered out among us. And if you are, you haven't given your life to the Lord, then we welcome you. We're glad to have you with us. I hope that today, by the time you hear the word of God and see the love that Jesus has for you, that you'll come in and be a part of the family and give your life to Christ as well. But we as believers, we've got to be the grown-ups. We've got to be the ones that are mature. We're not coming to get what the church can give us. We're coming to give. And say, Lord, how can I offer? And don't worry, like I said, you're going to be filled. 
This man was one that was coming to get. And I also find something else interesting about him at this time, not yet really being a part of the family or in the kingdom. He also had to be carried to church each week. Isn't that interesting? How many of us are here today because we had to be carried here? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, mom and dad made me come. I've got a friend that keeps bugging me to death, so I finally came. Or my husband or my wife, they kept bothering me so much, I finally gave in. Whatever your reason is, and don't nudge each other, okay? <laughs> but whatever your reason is, listen, God brought you here for a purpose. You may think, well, I was carried here by somebody else. But understand, we're going to see that by the time God is through with this man who was carried there by someone else, God changes his life in a radical way. Is that exciting? And so it doesn't matter the reason you're here or whether or not somebody carried you here or not. The Lord wants to touch your life and he wants to change you. And I love it because regardless of the motive, whether or not we came to be blessed or whether we came to bless or whether or not we simply came because we were forced to come, whatever the case might be, this is cool to me because regardless of the motive, we're going to see God changes him. God touches him and God you know, makes his life worth something, brings him into the kingdom of God and part of the family. Now, notice also he was outside of the temple area. He was outside of the gate. And why was he outside of the gate? Well, again, that was the great place to beg at the door where all the believers came in. And a lot of people that want to ask for money, they know that believers have a big heart for that. And they realize if you get around people that have compassion, they're probably going to give me some money. At least some of them will. So it's a great place to hang out. It might have been that he had a disease as well. And he was unclean, Levitically, by the law to come into that area. We know that he was crippled. He couldn't have served in many of the services because of that. And again, I believe he doesn't know the Lord at this point. It's something else we have revealed to us in this. But it also shows us a picture of why we oftentimes are on the outside rather than the inside. You ever go to a place and feel like you, you maybe you're in there, but you're an outsider? As maybe there's some kind of spiritual uncleanness. There's some reason that we're not really acceptable to the Lord. So although we're here, we're not really, we don't feel like we're a part of the family. I'll never forget when I first came to the Lord. I was single. I was by myself. I had spent a lot of time out west before I came. I got saved in Nashville, Tennessee, but I was out west and God was already drawing me in. It's funny, we talk about being carried to church. Many people had carried me to church over the years, but now the Holy Spirit was dragging me to church. It was like for some reason I was getting up and going. And I look back now, God was drawing me in because I just it was just Him pulling me to Himself and I would go. But for a long time, for the first couple of years that I went to church, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't give my life to the Lord. And I really got upset during the teachings, quite honestly. I, the first church I started going to really once I started really getting convicted about the Lord was Calvary Chapel. And if you don't believe that the Bible's true and you want to think that you're right, that is not the best first church to go to because all they do is teach the Bible and everything you believe gets proven wrong as they just read it. So as I'm there, I'm getting mad because the guy would read the Bible and I would go, you know, that, that just can't be right. And I, there's this whole internal struggle going on because my whole mindset was having to change you know, about, you know, who I was and, and why I was there and, and all that was going on. I basically would just, until God got me to the place to where I finally realized, you know what, I'm a part of the family. I felt like an outsider. I didn't feel like I fit in. And I didn't, there weren't, there weren't people I could hang out with or even wanted to hang out with because I wasn't a part of that. Now, if that's you today, if that's you today, it's one thing to be kind of a, a person who's on your own. There's different personalities. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you're a person here today that feels like this is not really your family, that you don't really belong, then probably you've never entered through the beautiful gate. You probably are not part of the family yet. And God has brought you here, whether he carried you here, whether he drug you here, whatever he did, God has brought you here because he wants you to be a part of the family. And right now his spirit is speaking to you saying, I died for you. Receive me as Lord and enter the kingdom. And we're going to see that this is exactly what happens to this guy today. But he's an outsider because he's not in, he's in, but he's not in yet. And as I thought about this man, I realized what a picture this is of the unbeliever. Again, if that's you, then this is going to bear witness with you, but it bears witness with me before I came to the Lord because I remember even though I went, I was only an outsider. I looked around and saw that other people seemed to be enjoying it. When they were worshiping, their hands would be raised, and that's not a sign that you're saved or not saved. But some people in congregations where there are believers, some clap their hands, some raise their hands, some are just quietly worshiping with themselves. But either way, you can tell they're having a relationship. They're having an experience. I didn't have that. It was weird. I looked around, you know, and these people were actually like raising their hands or clapping. Some of them even have Bibles. <laughs> it's not like any church I'd ever been in before. And it was kind of worrisome. I'm like, you know, this, and I joke about it saying worrisome because I was either in something really strange or I finally was for the first time realizing what true church was. If that's you and you feel like an outsider, you know, you're unable to enter in, maybe it's simply because you don't know the Lord yet. You're like the man laying there at the gate 
unable to get in. You know, the Bible says that he was born physically crippled, but the Bible also says that each of us are born spiritually crippled. That is, we're born in sin. So if you don't know the Lord right now, you are born in sin, you are spiritually crippled, you're unable to walk with the Lord. It's not possible yet until you receive him as Lord. And I'll tell you something else that I did that maybe some of you have been doing if you don't know the Lord today is you use a lot of lame excuses as to why you can't. And here's this man who's literally lame. And no doubt his lame excuse was, well, I've got to collect money and I've got to get money because I've got to pay my bills and I've got to help do this or whatever. And he had all these lame excuses like I used to use, you know, before I came to the Lord. I'm not ready. I want some more time. I don't know what I think. All these kind of things. And what's neat about this is God's going to send this believer along, Peter and John, they're going to grab him by the hand and say, enough with the lame excuses. Get up. Walk with the Lord. Come through the beautiful gate and be a part of the family. Why, how long will you lay out here on the outside dying and miserable when there's so much life on the inside for you? And it's not just the church as far as coming in and being a part of the church. It's that relationship with the Lord. And so, again, we're going to see that when he does, he starts leaping and praising, and God changes his life radically like he did for many of us in this room. And so he goes to ask alms there at the temple. Notice who's seeing Peter and John, verse 3, about to go into the temple, ask them for alms. So he's begging for money. And again, you know, they know what to do. They know where to try to find compassion and see if somebody will give him some money. And I love this. Look what Peter did. And fixing his eyes on him with John... Peter said, look at us. Now, there's a sense of urgency in that wording there. It means you ever had somebody stare at you and they're really trying to get your attention? <laughs> Maybe as a kid, you're bugging mom to death and she goes, look at me. Okay, all the moms are going, yeah, 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 I got that one. That's what this word means. It's like, okay, stop whining. Stop with the lame excuses as to why you can't enter in the beautiful gate. Stop just laying there. Look at us. Look at me. I'm going to give you the answer. I'm going to tell you about the hope you have in Jesus Christ, and I want you to pay attention. This is what we need to be doing with the culture around us. Now, I'm not saying be rude and get in their face and all that. But, guys, we need to talk to people that have all these issues or whatever. Say, Who, what you need? You need Jesus Christ. You know, we have an answer for everything today by some program or some self-help thing or some whatever or, you know, Dr. Phil or whatever the case might be. You know, it's like, come on, guys, you're not going to get answers from Dr. Phil. I mean, as a believer, and maybe it's because I know what the Word says, the answers are so basic that somebody gives that are right. I'm saying, that's it? You know, it's like, well, you know, I've got this drinking problem. Well, you need to quit drinking. <laughs> oh, that was great wisdom. Thank you. But it's one thing for us to tell somebody the obvious. It's another thing to say, here's the power to do it. See, what this man is about to find out is that with Jesus Christ, there's real power. Now, you guys know my testimony. When I came to the Lord, I was a messed up pup. And God literally grabbed me and set me free from a lot of things that had me in bondage for many years. He set me free, just boom. He got my hand and said, now walk with the Lord. Enter in through the beautiful gate. Stop with the lame excuses. You know, quit complaining about whatever this or that ever. You know, don't say you can't do it. Of course you can't. I know you can't. Why do you think I came to the earth? Why do you think I died on the cross? Because you can't do it, Mark. That's why I did it. Just grab my hand and hang on. And I did that and God set me free. And that's exactly what the Lord does for us. We need to give that message to people because people say, you know what, I don't know what to do. My husband, my, my boyfriend, my family member, whatever, they're drinking all the time and I can't this and maybe I'll get them in that class and get them in this class. Look, you may be able to get them in a class that by works in their own efforts can temporarily set them free maybe of drinking. And maybe even by efforts every day, they can spend the whole rest of their life without drinking. But the problem is, is they're still on their way to eternal judgment by God. Do you follow me? If all we do is set them free from alcohol, what have we done? We've sent them sober to hell. We've got to give them Jesus. Because say, look, and you know what? If you receive Jesus and you meet him and he sets you free, you don't need those classes. The Lord can do it. This man is a living testimony. I mean, some of you have that background and you have that testimony. I have that background. I have that testimony. And I've seen what God's power can do to set a person free. Many of you have seen what God can do to set a person free. We need to be offering that to people. So Peter, okay, enough of this. Again, it says they were going up on a regular basis all these years. This man was going up on a regular basis all these years. Everyone knew him. He was a regular fixture there at church when you went to church. And Peter now, again, has, has just, this is it. You need Jesus. Stop with the, stop with the, Let's stop this now. Let the Lord help you. Look at us. And look at verse 5. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from him. He's like, all right, I've got a Christian here. They're going to give me some cash. And I love what Peter says. Notice this. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. And quite literally, remember, they'd given everything to the church at this point. 
Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Is that greater what? In other words, I may not have all the answers to all your problems. I may not be able to help you financially. I may not be the best counselor in the word. I may not know how to solve all your family's problems and how to keep your marriage from falling apart, but I can give you Jesus. If you want to receive him right now, you can be born again and you can have eternity in heaven and he'll help you with all those problems. Is that not powerful or what? Some of you are thinking, I don't have anything to offer. I don't have anything. I I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of this. I don't have a lot of ability. I'm not gifted in that. You've got the greatest gift that everyone in the world needs, and it's Jesus Christ. You've got that gift. We need to offer that gift to people. He's the answer. And I love it because Peter says, I don't have all the other stuff, but what I do have, I'll give you. I love the simplicity, and I love the power. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Uh, I find it interesting. According to a lot of scholars, they believe the beautiful gate was what we call the Nicanor Gate, or what the Jews called the Nicanor Gate, which incidentally, out of all the gates that entered the temple... It was the only one that didn't have silver and gold. All the other gates were lined with silver and gold. This one particular gate was lined only in bronze. It was massive. They said it took 20 priests, 20 men, just to open the Nicanor Gate. So this huge, massive wooden door that was covered in bronze, and all the pastors had to get together in the morning and you know, open the door for the day, 20 of them. And this massive thing going on, the only one that didn't have silver and gold, and yet they called it the beautiful gate. Why? Because of its intricacy, the enormity of it, how amazing it was. This gate was beautiful, so they called it the beautiful gate. And I find it interesting here, the symbolism, because being the only gate that didn't have silver and gold, it was the only gate this guy laid at. And he said, look, even as there's no silver and gold to offer you, that's not your answer. Money's not going to help you. Think All these things aren't going to help you. You need Jesus. And so I find it very symbolic and very appropriate that the only gate that didn't have silver and gold, Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. Even this door doesn't have silver and gold, but this door is beautiful and it's a door that opens to the kingdom of God. Would you like to walk in? Would you like to have Jesus Christ? See, that's what God's offering you today if you don't know him. And that's what God has offered all of us. And that's what this man here is being offered right now. It's not the things of the world that will make you happy. It's not the silver and the gold. Again, that can be a blessing and there's nothing wrong in that. And God does that from time to time. But that's not going to fill the heart. Talk to wealthy people. Does the money alone fill their heart? Absolutely not. Maybe a year or two. You know, because it can be exciting and thrilling by what you can do with that. But when it comes to living life and looking toward death and we're looking toward the future, it means nothing. It's got to be something real. It's got to be a relationship with the Lord. And, and I love this because, again, you know, Jesus is the door. He's the gate into heaven. He is the beautiful gate. He said, I'm the door. And we have that door to offer for all those that are laying outside of it. You know, we can give them that door. Now, something else I find interesting about this, bronze in Scripture is the medal of judgment. It's the medal of judgment. It represents judgment in Scripture. Here lies this lame man laying at the gate of judgment. Here come Peter and John with the keys and the way into the door or the gate to heaven. Guys, that's us. There's a world out there that is marred, that is laying at the gate of judgment. We hold the keys and the gate to the door of life. That beautiful gate, Jesus Christ, that lets him in the kingdom. We need to be sharing it. Again, structure is great, but this is the action the church is to be taking. And I don't know about you, if you don't have a gift of evangelism, I do not. I get around evangelists. You guys remember Ebo, uh, Ebo Elder, he popped in again recently. You know, th- he, this guy is a gift of evangelism. I love being around them because they can't help themselves but evangelize. Thanks for coming to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark for his study in the book of Acts. This groundbreaking book is what spearheaded the Christian movement as we know it, recounting the beginnings of the church. What an incredible time it must have been, experiencing eyewitnesses of Jesus being passionate and bold in their faith. These disciples, who became apostles of the faith, are inspiring in their courage and in their sacrifice. It doesn't go without notice that all the original disciples were brutally killed for their faith or tortured and exiled. Why would these people do this? What was worth risking and even losing their lives for? Well, it's a fact that what they lived and died for was and is true to this day. Jesus came to save, and by believing in that, life here on earth doesn't hold the end all to living. 
Have you come to a belief in what you've heard today? We'd like to know. If you go to thewaymedia.net, you'll find a questions and comments link. Go ahead and fill out this form, and we'd like to know what you gain from today's teaching, as well as anything we can be praying for. You can also listen to additional messages in this series and other books of the Bible in the Come to the Table section at thewaymedia.net. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but Pastor Mark has more to share from the exciting book of Acts. We're thankful that you are a part of our listening audience today, and we look forward to you tuning in to our next edition. So come hear more from Pastor Mark next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.